for 30 plus years. I've seen every type of child grow up. Instead of giving me what I wanted, she gave me what I needed, which was truth. Don't let emotions win. Let truth win. Do your very best, and you should have a lot of fun while you do it. And the better you get at something, the more fun you're going to have at something. You moms and dads are wired with everything you need to be a parent to a great kid. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. This is episode number 124, and I'm your host, Dr. Meg Meeker. Today, my guest is Shanti Feldhahn. Shanti is a best-selling author, a popular speaker, and a respected social researcher. She received her graduate degree from Harvard University and previously worked on Capitol Hill and Wall Street. Shanti's groundbreaking books have sold more than 3 million copies worldwide and have been translated into 25 different languages. Languages. Some of her most notable works include For Women Only, For Men Only, The Kindness Challenge, and her newest work, Thriving in Love and Money. Her findings have been diversely published in various media outlets, including The Today Show, New York Times, and Mom Life Today. She speaks nationwide at dozens of events each year. Shanti and her husband, Jeff, have two teenage children and live in Atlanta. As always in this podcast, I will share my points to ponder for you to start using right away. And remember, parents, please don't just download the episodes, click subscribe, because when you do that, you're joining my parenting revolution and every new episode will automatically show up in your subscribe list. And please write us a review on iTunes and let us know what you think of the podcast. We're not only on iTunes, but the PGK podcast is available in the Google Play Store and on Stitcher. So no matter where you get your podcast, subscribe today and don't miss a single episode. Friends, I also want to tell you I have a brand new free webinar out called When No Stops Working. I would really encourage you to go to my website, meekerparenting.com and listen to my webinar, When No Stops Working. It's about how to discipline and interact with your kids when they stop listening to you. And that happens to just about 99% of us. Very informative uh, webinar. So parents, thanks for listening. This is episode number 124. Stay with us. I want you now to listen in on a conversation I had with Shanti Feldhahn. I know you're really going to enjoy it. Well, I'm really excited. My guest today is Shanti Feldhahn, and she has written a fabulous new book, Find Joy, A Devotional Journey to Unshakable Wonder in an Uncertain World. Shanti, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so delighted. You're one of my heroes, so it's an honor to be with you. <laughs> well, right back at you. I, I, we, we really need to sit and have coffee sometime because we're, we're two of these people that just sort of um, travel in parallel roads. And I think, yeah. oh, what is she doing? But, you know, but we really never get to see each other and talk. So I'm, I'm really grateful to have this time. Your book is fabulous. You know, the timing of it couldn't be better. Find joy. And I think that that is something every single person on the planet wants. And it seems, finding joy seems to be really pretty elusive. Um, but, you know, where we are now, you know, to sort of say that life in the U.S. is chaotic and even frightening is, is an, understand, an understatement. We've got COVID and riots and political fighting and, and parents and kids feel anxious. So what would you say to those parents, and even if the kid's listening, right at the outset about how to navigate a really tough time in life? Well, one of the things that really stood out to me as I was doing the research for this devotional is just how much joy is supposed to be the characteristic of mm -hmm. the Christian. Joy is supposed to be the characteristic of someone who is trying to live the life that we're called to live. And it doesn't always look like that, especially this mm -hmm. year. Right. And, um, and there really is a, um, a reality that it is possible and we we tend not to be purposeful about it and we kind of let our feelings be impacted by you know whatever is going on at the moment and that's something we tell our kids mm -hmm. that they shouldn't do but we but we do it we do it yeah. <laughs> and so that's one of the things that really struck me 
is um, is just how much we are supposed to be having joy regardless of what is going on around us and regardless of our personal circumstances. Mm -hmm. You know, you're absolutely right, because I think that we are so driven by our emotions and we pay attention. I think a lot of parents pay a lot of attention to their kids' emotions and they want their kids to be happy. And I totally get it. You know, I raised four kids. Now we have grandkids and I just really want them to be happy. But there's a difference between happiness and joy, isn't there? Yeah, I think the easiest way um, that I think of that is you're pursuing happiness when you're pursuing things that make you happy, Mm -hmm. right? Like you're trying to you know, you're longing to, to be married or you're longing to have another child or you're longing to not have children in virtual school. Right. <laughs> whatever, yeah. whatever it is that's, you know, driving you crazy. If only I can just get to this thing, it will make me happy. Right. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting good circumstances. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet we can't be looking to those things for happiness because that's not real and eternal and true. And joy is what's under that. It's this bedrock. It's this eternal sense of wonder at the life that we've been given. Um, And that does not, should not change by those circumstances. It, it, it is not something that we're looking for in something in the same way. Right. So joy is something that's internal and happiness is something that is our happiness is an emotion that's affected by what's around us. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. happiness is, is often very much dependent on circumstances yeah. where joy is not. Well, I think as parents, it makes perfect sense that we work as hard as we do and we live the crazy lives we do because if we want our kids to be happy, what it's all about is finding ways to make them happy. You know, get them to the right school, make sure they eat the right foods, get them the right friends, get them in the right sport, and that will make them happy or unhappy. And and then we look at our kids and go, well, you're happy now, so I guess life should be okay. The problem is it doesn't last. And the problem is they begin to depend on other people to make them emotionally happy. And that's as tempting as that is, that's really not nice to a child. So what I hear you saying is parents, rather than focus on helping your kids be happy, let's focus on finding, helping them find joy and yes. helping ourselves find joy because joy is deeper. Joy will last longer. And is it fair to say joy isn't dependent upon the weight loss, your exercise, the friends you have, the sports you play, or how good you are at stuff? Or, or is joy connected to that, those things? No, I would say it's probably fair to say that to the degree that we're blown around by those things, you know, I really would love to lose 10 pounds and I haven't been able to and it's driving me crazy. And every time I look in the mirror, I'm unhappy. Mm-hmm. If I just get, if I just lose the 10 pounds, will that change my level of joy? Mm-mm. Because it's not connected to that. It may change how I feel for the day. Right. <laughs> Are you talking about me or you? <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely me. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Definitely but, me. No, but, but you know, it's funny because we as women and our daughters as girls are yeah. trained. We're so brainwashed to believe that if we lose weight or we get this, we get this, not yeah. only will that make us happy, then we will have joy. Then will we ha- have our life set mm-hmm. for us. But it really doesn't work that way. And I think that what's going on around us now is a really good time, as hard as it is, to realize, wait a minute, I'm not happy anymore. You know, my family's divided. My neighbors won't talk to me. They ripped uh, the sign for Biden or Trump out of my yard. Um, <laughs> you know, people are saying mean things to me. Um People call me names because I'm an evangelical Christian or because I'm a Catholic or whatever. Um, So I don't feel really happy. What in the world are you talking about when you say find joy in a life that feels so, there's so much animosity around me? 
Yeah, it's, it is fascinating when you really look down deep at what this means and how to do it. It is so encouraging once you come to the realization that you mean that my feelings don't need to be turned and tossed by whatever chaotic is going on around me. That's, that's this completely new thought for many of us. It's, it's a, it's not the way we normally live. And I think all of us hearing this, I would be really surprised if anyone listening to you oh, goes, no, 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 I prefer the have to have my feelings dependent on my circumstances. Like, you know, no, most yeah, of us, right. we, we, we want this sense of living in this abundance and this eternal wonder that doesn't change. And I'll give you an example of this, actually, um, you know, approaching a Christmas season, for mm-hmm. example, of all of us generally know the feeling that comes upon us at Christmas time. Now, obviously, that's a difficult season for some people. Mm-hmm. But for probably the majority, it's almost like real life kind of holds its breath, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's there's a sense of heavenly wonder that just invades the world. And you walk around with a different, this joyful feeling. And it's because it feels like real life is is sort of put on hold right. for a little while, right? And I realized when I when you look at the scripture of the angels announcing the birth of this baby 2,000 years ago, um, bringing good news of great joy for all the people and realizing when you look at the, when I was looking at the concordance and looking at the translations and, and realizing that that means two things, that actually means... Um, that the the news is causing great joy that Jesus was born, but also that Jesus came to bring us great joy. And you look at that and you go, oh, my goodness, what that means sort of by definition Mm -hmm. is that that feeling that really only comes upon us for a week or two in December, Mm -hmm. that is what we're supposed to live in all the time, all year, all year round. And everybody is longing for that, I think, underneath. It's just we don't know how to get there. Right. You know, I think you're right. And and I think that's why we teach our kids about Santa Claus. You know, because, <laughs> no, really, because we want, right. <laughs> you know, we want, you can tell I have great kids in the house, but, but we want so much for an escape from what we know and feel. That's the breath holding that we're talking about. Yeah. And, and, and we want life to be different, even if it's just for a week or two. We want something supernatural. We want yeah. something that isn't with us all the time. And so, you know, and I always feel very joyful around Christmas, you know, but I also feel sad because it reminds me of a lot of loved ones who have gone before me. But but it's almost like you give yourself permission to celebrate, and you do. You say, okay, this part of life is awful, and this is awful, but, you know, for the next week, I'm going to eat as many cookies as I can find, <laughs> and I'm going to really have fun, and I'm going to be joyful, and I'm going to celebrate, yeah. and I'm going to put arguments with kids and family on hold. Life is going to be really different, and I think that When the angels announced the birth of Christ, of course, they were talking about something deeper than anybody had any idea was going to happen at that time. But basically, they came to say, your life is never going to be the same. You have reason to celebrate. Joy is here. Now, jump into this journey with me. And oh, by the way, find out what's ahead, which is a deeper joy. Yeah. And the the key for us is we have to understand what it looks like to live that way. If joy is supposed to be the mark of our lives, if that is one of the things that is very needed in the world, then what does it look like to do that? How do we get there? And that, to me, is such a crucial reason for the whole project that we're talking about today, because I think all of us want that. We know there's something deeper for us, and we we don't know how. So you just wrote the book. 
Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we're going to find out about today. And um, you're a researcher. And, you know, what I love is a lot of what you write is supported by solid uh, research. And you always say that science aligns with scripture. Um, you also talk about eight key elements in finding joy. So let's, can you teach us now how we find joy and what those elements are? Yeah, the, it's interesting. And just so you know, it is actually accurate. Every single one of the projects that I've ever done, and I've now done, oh man, I'm in the middle of my 11th big kind of nationally representative study. Um, I've done four or five sort of sub-studies. Every single one of these backs up what scripture has awesome. said all along, which, you know, I yeah. love. And we we did actually look pretty intently at what are the things that both scripture and science say about how to do this? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of knowledge. It doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to always implement, but for us and for our kids, it's, it actually is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. And we, we found that there were eight things that really matter the most. There's plenty of other things that matter. Mm -hmm. But there's these eight trends that run through science and run through scripture, neurobiology, neuroscience, the different ways that God has created us that really matter. And if we can practice these it, it just changes us. Mm -hmm. um, one of probably one of the most uh, most practical from a day to day standpoint is to practice gratitude. Because mm. it's it's interesting, you know how we tell our kids you need to have an attitude of gratitude, <laughs> and and it's maybe easier to explain that to a child sometimes than it is to explain it to ourselves mm -hmm. in the middle of difficult circumstances. And um and to me, one of the most telling examples of how to do this comes from um well the the scriptural example is something that many of us can resonate with today when there's so many interpersonal conflicts mm -hmm. right and i mean whether it's about politics or whatever i mean it could be that your your relationship with your spouse is difficult right now mm -hmm. There is a great passage, and if you look at the, the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in the city of Philippi, um, and he's talking to, like, this is the first community church of Philippi, right? Mm -hmm. Like, this is, this is um, what any one of us probably can understand as, as a church that we go to, where you see a personality conflict in action. And he's talking to these two women who are like, Pillars in the church. And I don't know, the women's ministry director and the children's director. I don't know. I'm making that up. But you know what uh, I mean? Yeah. Like, uh -huh. And they're having this personality conflict. And he says, their, their names are Euodia and Syntyche. And he says, I plead with you, ladies, get along. And he tells the church, help these ladies get along. Because it's difficult, right? When you're having interpersonal issues, it's difficult to have that sense of joy, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. it is fascinating when he says, how do you do that? He says two things that just blow your mind once you realize what he's saying. The first prescription is rejoice, mm -hmm. have joy. And he says, I'm going to say it again, rejoice. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, I don't know about you, but I look at that and I go, okay, like, how do you do that when you're a persecuted church? How do you rejoice in a difficult situation? How do you rejoice in a difficult marriage? Mm -hmm. All of these situations. And he says, here's what you do. Here's the prescription. You think on whatever is lovely. You think about whatever is excellent. You think about whatever is worthy of praise rather than, you know, what's worthy of driving you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems to take over your life. Parents, I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Shanti Feldhahn. We need to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more of my conversation with Shanti. Parents, now that I'm spending more time at home, I'm finding messes can show up just about anywhere, especially where you least expect them. And that means I need a vacuum that's versatile enough to keep up with it all. That's where my new Hoover Blade Plus comes in. It's versatile, adaptable, and ready for whatever life throws at it. Blade Plus is a real powerhouse in cord-free cleaning. 
It's engineered with Hoover's Dust Vault technology that captures dust and fine particles as you clean. Messes aren't just limited to the floors. That's why Blade Plus converts to a hand vac with a variety of included tools to get the job done no matter what. Blade Plus is cordless, powered by Hoover's removable, rechargeable lithium-ion battery. Hoover has a whole lineup of cordless cleaners powered by the same battery, so you can simply swap and go from job to job, just like some popular power tool brands these days. Friends, I have a confession. I am a vacuum cleaner junkie. I love good vacuum cleaners because I love clean floors. I have wood floors, tile floors, carpeted floors, and I like to have them all clean most all of the time. That's why a good vacuum cleaner is my friend. And friends, I have the Hoover Blade Plus and I can't tell you how much I love it. I keep it in my kitchen. I grab it off of the charger and I can take it just about anywhere. It's light and it's strong enough to clean the wood floors in my kitchen, the tile in my mudroom, and the thick carpeting in my living room. And friends, I'll tell you, I have grandkids riding scooters up and down my kitchen floors. My husband works in the wood a lot and frequently drags wood chips, dirt, mud, you name it, into our house. And my Hoover Blade Plus can tackle it all. Plus, I love the variety of included tools that I get with the Hoover Blade Plus because I can vacuum my carpets, I can switch out the tools, I can vacuum the corners in my ceiling, and I can even vacuum my drapes and my couch. I just love my Hoover Blade Plus. If you're ready to experience cord-free, adaptable cleaning for yourself, check out the Blade Plus at hoover.com. That's H-O-O-V-E-R dot com. It's versatile enough to fit into any cleaning routine. Get your own Hoover Blade Plus today. And don't forget to check out Hoover on Facebook and Instagram. You know, and the thing I love about Philippians is that it's often referred to as the book of joy. And Paul wrote it from prison. Yeah. And you can bet that prison was horrible. Yeah. And so when somebody like that writes a book about joy, this guy knows what he's talking about because he's probably experienced a joy deeper than you and I have who live a pretty cushy life. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I think, I mean, this is so, so that when he says these words, they have teeth to them. Yeah. Well, and they, it's interesting. The neuroscience shows why God created us in such a way that that choice to choose to focus on those things that are excellent and lovely and worthy of praise, right? That choice to do that, it actually drastically changes um, the the what's going on in our brains and how we're wired. Mm-hmm. If, and, I'll, and I'll give you an example of this that cracked me up. I actually, one of the, one of the devotional days in this book, I, I, I had to put the story in there because it made me laugh. There was a group of, I think, British um, neuroscientists, no, British um, plastic surgeons <laughs> that submitted to the equivalent of the FDA, you know, their government healthcare, you know, group that said, you know, we think Botox may actually be be a type of antidepressant because you know you find an epilepsy med and it turns out to be a antidepressant or whatever right. and they yeah. thought botox might be that you know you have these injections to smooth out lines and wrinkles and they found that their patients were just feeling more joyful and more positive and they thought maybe there's a chemical reaction we should study it and they studied it and they found out it had nothing to do with that hmm. and it turns out that botox paralyzes the frown muscles there you go (laughs) these people couldn't frown and when (laughs) when they couldn't frown they felt less frowny (laughs) (laughs) you know you're right what a great what a great point that is something that we and our kids can grab onto like literally the choice to focus on something that is good and worthy of joy rather than what's worthy of driving you nuts Mm -hmm. 
it literally changes your mind. And it because of that, it changes your feelings. And it changes your neurochemistry. And I think that, you know, the flip side of focusing, just like the Botox of focusing on what you're grateful for and what you, you know, what there is in your life that could give you joy is focusing on preventing thinking about those things. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of friends who complain a lot and, and I probably complain a lot too, but complaining does nothing but make you worse. It doesn't solve any problems. It doesn't help you work your problems out. It isn't just venting. It's saying the same thing over and over and over. It's the frown. It's the frown. And if you just train yourself to stop complaining, you know, verbally, that alone will make you feel better. And then you're maybe you're more open to focusing on things that you're grateful for. Because yeah. I think about people you know, who are anxious or depressed, or they have, uh, I see a number of teenagers with really bad OCD, where their mind just goes, you know, round and round and round and round on the same thing. But the nice thing about what you're saying is it's a practical thing that people can do. And even if it's, you have to just write down what you're grateful for on paper, if even if you can't say it, that alone will change your thinking, won't it? It will. Actually, <clears throat> it's interesting that you mention the idea of venting, because that was one of the things that once we started looking at the neuroscience behind some of this and the neurobiology behind some of this, that there's a really important principle that we have to kind of debunk in our minds, actually. Um, it's not just writing down what we're grateful for. It's being careful not to express dissatisfaction, mm. because we all have bought a myth. We've believed a lie. And there's this concept in our culture that venting is healthy because it's like letting a little steam out of the kettle, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't explode. And I, I was doing an event for a major um, public university about a week and a half ago, a virtual event, of course. And it was on mental health and some of the things that, you know, students are dealing with today. And I asked as a poll what is the most healthy response when you're frustrated by something? Gave them an example, treated unfairly or whatever. And what's the healthiest response? And one of the options was, you know, vent a little steam out so that you're not stuffing it so that the, it doesn't explode. And 88% of the students chose that as okay. the healthiest answer, mm -hmm. 88%. And they were shocked when I said, guess what? <laughs> We've all bought that myth. It turns out it's completely inaccurate neurologically. It turns out that all the, what the neuroscientists have found, there's a guy named Brad Bushman at OSU who's done a lot of study on anger management, etc. And he's actually found that what happens is when you vent or when you go on social media and get all exercised yeah, yeah, <laughs> about yeah. whatever. Exercised. <laughs> exercised. That's, that's, that's a very word. nice way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that when we do this, what actually happens is it's activating this interconnected anger system in the brain. And the way that the neuroscientists have put it is it's actually the idea, the whole word picture of venting is completely wrong. The better word picture is that when you do that, you're turning up the heat under the pot. Ah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that when you will refuse to handle things in that kind of complainy way, there's nothing wrong with like sharing with a friend, asking for advice, you know, trying to connect with someone on a real issue in your heart and trying to solve it. It's the rah, rah, rah kind yeah. of stuff, mm -hmm. the complainy kind of stuff mm -hmm. that turns up the heat. And instead, when you refuse to do that and you basically say you know what yeah right now I just want to respond everything in me wants to respond to this comment on social media mm -hmm. that I just got or this text message or this whatever and you don't do that and you choose to sort of go no you know what I'm I'm not I'm not going to respond what actually happens in your brain is it's the equivalent of taking the kettle off the burner entirely and especially if you can turn it and you go yeah that comment that my friend made is so wrong in my mind but you know what I'm so grateful for that friend 
I'm mm. so grateful that they're in my life. I'm Ooh, so grateful for the time yeah. that, they, <laughs> that they brought the meal over when I was yeah. laid up from surgery or whatever. Mm. And you start focusing on that. It's like the steam just completely goes away. Mm -hmm. And you are training yourself in the type of joy that does not change by circumstances. So let's um, apply that to parent-child relationships because it, it sounds like a different way of saying something that I tell parents, but I never really realized why I was saying it. And you just <laughs> explained it to me. Is that I often tell parents, you know, get very, very, very frustrated with their kids and angry. And the kid does something and they're mad and they're mad and they're mad. And they get in this sort of vicious cycle of, you know, mom, I hate you. How dare you say that to me? Mom, I hate you. How? And, and, I, and I try to tell parents, you know, pull back and um, don't take your, what your kids say personally. Sort of stand back and, and let it go by you. Don't wear it. You know, don't let it come in on you. So talk about how a parent who's dealing with a kid that makes them very angry and frustrated, how can they apply the principle that you're talking about to improve their relationship with their kids so they, they don't get up all balled up in this vicious cycle of anger and frustration? Yeah, it's, it's a really, really, uh, what you've just said is a really, really important point that every one of us, A, needs to learn and B, has failed at. Um, oh, yeah, but yeah. It, but it is so crucial. And actually, I'll, I'll hearken back for a minute to one of my big um, sort of national research studies when we were doing this on what we call the 30-day kindness challenge. And we were trying to do pre-surveys and post-surveys with people who did this challenge for 30 days to figure out what, what most changed people's relationships, what's most changed their minds and their demeanors and their feeling inside and their ability to have joy and all that stuff that we've been talking about. And we found that one of the key things that is actually uh, crucial is withholding our tendency to be negative mm. and that negative that can look like a bunch of different things everybody has a different pattern we identified seven different sort of patterns of negativity that that tend to come up with us i'll tell you mine which is embarrassing but i'll tell it to you anyway <laughs> which is my pattern of negativity is exasperation Oh, yeah. And getting irritated and having that, you know, my son, he has some special needs issues and we'd work on homework for, you know, three hours and then he'd forget to turn it in. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just, you want to pull your hair you know, out. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And when I would say, you know, I can't believe we worked on it and you didn't turn it in. And this is the third time that's happened. And my voice is rising and I've got that exasperated tone. I don't realize that it's not just, huh, yeah, there's some technical exasperation there. Uh-uh. I don't realize that what is actually being communicated to my sweet, sensitive son is, you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. And that is what we don't realize as parents, is that it, it doesn't matter how they communicate to us. I mean, it does. That's a, another topic. But when we communicate back, we have to think about what is being received. Mm -hmm. And if we will practice withholding that type of negativity, and that's why we did that 30-day kindness challenge, because it takes a little bit of time for us to develop new habits. The first two days we found scientifically, two to three days of the 30-day kindness challenge, you are basically spending the entire time going, oh my word, I had no idea I did this so often. And that is the key, is that we are blind to how often that happens and how much we are re-triggering that anger system in our brain. We have no idea how much has become a part of our habits, a part of our lives. And withholding it and going, wow, I had no idea how hard this was going to be, and retraining ourselves it changes everything, not just our relationship with our kids. You know, I think it would be a good um, experiment to do, as I'm sitting here thinking, to turn on um, a recorder 
a recording in your your computer, your phone Mm. for five hours and put it in your kitchen and listen to how you talk to people. And that's kind of a scary thing for me because I think I've tried to do this with my husband to listen to how I talk to him. And if you just tweak a few things, your tone of voice, you know, get up and walk into the room and talk face to face. Don't yell from three rooms away. But even tiny smoke, do you do that too? (laughs) Oh, no. I was like, she's nailing me. You know, it drives me crazy. But these small things that we do that really uh, bring a lot of tension, not just into our lives, but into the relationships we've had. Well, this is why everybody needs to read your book, because we're running out of time, and we've only gone through one of your um, examples of what people need to do in order to find joy. Um, before we before we wrap up, can you just give us you know one more piece of uh, you know um, meaty idea that you talk about in your book to give people a little more of a flavor what's there? Sure. One of the other elements that's really um, very crucial, especially today, um, is to reach out, mm-hmm. um, and it is very easy to get very self-focused without intending to and without realizing that we are. But actually reaching out to others, it changes our our whole perspective on life in this very supernatural way. Kindness, for example, is a very supernatural thing. It melts the hearts of other people around us, especially if there's contention and division, um, And it changes us as well. Literally, one of the things that the neurobiologists have found is that when you are kind to someone, especially if they've provoked you (laughs) and you're you're kind instead, um, it actually releases oxytocin, which is often considered like the bonding hormone, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. And yet they actually find that it, it, no, it's, it's released when you're kind to others and it releases nitric acid and lowers your blood pressure. Mm. So you feel more calm. So that's an example of, again, if your kids are aggravating you, be kind to them and suddenly you just, you don't feel all balled up anymore. And it works that way with the, the neighbor that loves to yell at you over the fence too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, what I hear you saying too is that we need to learn to think differently to speak differently, to act differently. And if we do those things, then joy comes. Joy isn't just yes. sitting down thinking, okay, how do I get it? How do I get it? How do I get yeah. it? Um, you know, who do I need to change in my environment? What do I need to get rid of? What friendship do I need to break off in order to feel joy? It has nothing to do with that. It really is about changing some of the things that we do on a day-to-day basis and something much deeper and better than happiness comes which is which is joy because it doesn't just happen does it no it's not something that you can dredge up because it's again it's not dependent on what's going on around you Mm -hmm. it is a completely different mindset and perspective going wow what god has done and a, a completely different perspective of recognizing the eternal situation that's always there, but we it, we get lost in the day to day, and it's finding it again. Yeah. Well, and I love joy because Christ came to give us joy and hope, and he he really wants us to have it. We we weren't born and put on this earth to feel miserable. <laughs> That wasn't the point. I don't think that was his point. (laughs) He really, it's so fundamental, but he he, he put us here to be in relationship with him and one another and to enjoy those relationships and to live more deeply, I think, than we're living um, in today. Her book is Find Joy, a devotional journey to unshakable wonder in an uncertain world. Shanti Feltan, thank you so much for joining me. Your book is amazing. Thank I, you. I feel different now than I did at the beginning of the podcast, and I have a few things I need to do when we, when we hang up as far as <laughs> how I talk to my grandkids and my husband. But I want to tell listeners what you're saying works. It's true, and it's real. And if people just apply some of the principles, the 
elements in the, your book that you're talking about, it really does change your life. And that's what I love about the work that you do. If people want to find more about you and your work, where can they find you? Probably the easiest thing is to go to Shanti.com. That's my main website, S-H-A-U-N-T-I.com. Great. I'm glad you spelled it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Shanti, thank you so much. Uh, Good luck with the book. I hope it becomes an international bestseller. It needs to be because joy shouldn't just stay in the United States. It needs to go everywhere. Oh, thanks. So kind of you. Thanks for the chance to share. Sure. Now on to my points to ponder. One. Joy is not the same as happiness. Most parents say that they just want their kids to be happy, and I agree. That's what I certainly wanted for our kids. Happiness means that on a day-to-day basis, you feel good, you have a lot of energy, and you have a positive outlook on life. In fact, many people who are happy infect others with happiness. In many ways, we can control our own level of happiness, stop complaining, have a more positive attitude, and change the way we think. But joy is different. It's deeper. Joy seems to be the underlying of the heart. Joy gives a person a deep sense of satisfaction. It's less fickle than happiness because it doesn't just float in or out. Joy allows us to know in the depths of our souls that even though we experience pain and trouble, that all will be well. God's got us. Number two, find one thing every day to say thank you for. You know, often we and our kids get stuck in a dark place because we fixate on everything that's going wrong in our lives. The weather's horrible. Your spouse doesn't understand you. The kids always fight. A streaming cycle of negativity only does one thing. It takes us to a darker place. This keeps joy from entering in. The best way to get out of this cycle and allow joy to come in is to find one thing each day that you're grateful for. Then say, Thank you, God. It may be something as simple as the fact that you have hot water, a comfortable bed, or your kids are healthy. And when you're going through a painful time, you can still say thank you. Because no matter what is happening, and even though you don't feel thankful, say it anyway, because there's always something to thank God for, even when you're mad at him. And boy, I've been there. Three, ask God. God for joy. In many ways, we control our happiness, but it seems that joy is a gift from another. We can't concoct it or work ourselves into finding joy. Joy is given. It is deep, and God is the giver of all deep things. So ask God for joy. Tell Him you're thankful to be alive. If you've struggled with grief, sadness, anxiety, or depression, it doesn't matter. God's crazy about you and wants you to experience things that he gives you. He wants you to have deep peace. He wants you to have deep joy. So ask him for it and then wait. He'll hear you and answer your prayers. Parents, you know that I love answering your questions. While I can't answer questions every podcast, I'm going to do a special podcast where all I do is answer your questions, and I answer questions on my website in my blog post. So please keep sending me any question you have. You can send them to askmeg at megmeekermd.com. I want to thank my guest, Shanti Feldhahn, for joining me on the show today. To find out more about Shanti, go to Shanti, that's S-H-A-U-N-T-I dot com. Be sure to follow her on social media. Just search for Shanti Feldhahn. And please, friends, remember to check out Shanti's new book, Find Joy, A Devotional Journey to Unshakable Wonder in an uncertain world. It's fabulous. And remember, friends, don't forget to sign up for my new free webinar, When No Stops Working. So let's recap my points to ponder. One, joy is not the same as happiness. Two, find one thing every day to say thank you for. And three, ask God for joy. So until next time, parents, always remember, that great kids are raised, not born. 
Hey, this is Bobby, producer of Meg Meeker's Parenting Great Kids podcast. Thanks for listening. And because of your dedication to raising great kids, Dr. Meg's Parenting Revolution has grown to over 3 million downloads. Head on over to Facebook and Twitter and follow at Meg Meeker MD and check out what's new at MegMeeker.com. And while you're there, sign up for the newsletter to stay updated and get information about giveaways. Don't forget to share the podcast with other parents. Subscribe so you won't miss anything and leave us a review so we know how we're doing.